Today's market call is presented by Fidelity. When you're trading options, Fidelity has just what you need with straightforward but powerful tools to help you select a strategy and execute your ideas. And they offer a wide range of information and insights to help simplify your trading experience. Have a question? Ask it live during their small classes and coaching sessions. Need information? Check out their educational videos, articles, and webinars. See why it's easy to trade options your way at Fidelity. Start now at fidelity.com slash options. All right, thanks to Guy Adami for that read, who is not here, but I have a great partner in crime. That would be CBW, Carter Braxton Worth of Worth Charting. Carter, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Uh, where is Guy? I hope he's... Guy, uh, guy, is, guy is... I'm just going to do what he always says that he does to other people. I'm just going to dox him here. He is in Ireland, um, and he is uh, attending a Georgetown University um, event over there. It's nice. an annual thing, and it's a, it's a really cool event, and they honor um, some really important people to that community. Um, and as you know, Carter, I got lots of peeps associated with Georgetown. I have a daughter there, another one going there. My wife went there. So Guy and I are like... You know, two peas in a pod and, when it comes indeed, to the boys. And, and events in uh, Ireland in April are better than ones in February. So yes, yeah, no, no good. Ma matter of fact, um, matter. listen, you and I got a lot to do today. It, it's an interesting day in the market, despite the fact the S and P is unchanged. It was down earlier. Um, some interesting sector moves. We'll talk about some single names here, um, but let's throw up the rundown really quickly here. Um, you had a report out on worth charting uh, yesterday, talking about some gaps, but we're also going to just basically do a chart check on the S and P five hundred. Um, really important name to me. I, I mentioned it yesterday on market call american express reports friday morning i kind of want to get in front of that especially given some of the volatility that we've seen out of the money center um, banks and some of their commentary in and around rates and consumer spending there's also lvh is out i don't know if you've checked that one out um carter um lvmh uh luxury um purveyor there um some volatility in and around that i think some disappointment so we'll take a look at uh, american express i think this is going to be really important especially as we're trying to figure out different quadrants of the consumer um we're going to trade that using the options and then also we're going to do a little trade management um an xlu trade and an slv trade one winner one loser we're going to show you how we manage those um options trades all right Let's talk about it. I haven't talked to you uh, in a couple of days, I think, at least a few trading days since last week. What do you make of the single stock volatility that we've seen in some of these money center banks? And, and really, you know, we have the S&P, which is in its largest drawdown, I want to say, in, in the many months, at least six months or so, Carter. That's right. Uh, well, for the latter first, this is we're now at the point intraday today, we're down more than 4%, which is absolutely nothing. That's the remarkable thing, right? And so since the October low, uh, we've had very little in the way of counter trend moves. Uh, a very steep, uncorrected six month advance, 28% uh, for the SP, 32 for the Qs, and then individual names like American Express, Venture Caterpillar, up 60. And so it's not just tech or AI, it's even old world mature companies such as American Express and Caterpillar that have doubled the performance of the SP. So things are full. Um, everything has come to life in many ways. And now we're having a bit of a churn and a stall. Always so hard to know uh, how far a drawdown, a sell-off, a correction, a dip, a decline will go. Does it stop here and make new highs? Does it drop 6% and then stop 10? Does it 20? But the point is we're seeing some distribution, right? And so some of the great high flyers, whether it was JP Morgan up about 48% from its low uh, or others that are starting to show signs of profit-taking, meaning people are coming out of positions um, and nothing wrong with that. But the question is, and hard to know, we'll try to figure it out together right now, how far down might we be headed from here? Yeah, Carter, before we hit the SPX charts here, um, what do you make of that uh, old market idiom that we don't crash off of highs? Um, and, you know, you hear that expression, right, every once in a while. Now, single names can do that. Um, but, you know, let's just throw up a live chart of JP Morgan. And I mentioned this yesterday. You know, I was out of pocket all day on Friday, um, had no idea what the markets were doing until 6 p.m. And, you know, uh, to see JP Morgan 
down 6% or plus in, in one trading day on a day where the S&P was down, what was it down 1% or something like that. And I looked at some of the other money center banks, expected them to be down an awful lot more. The XLF was down like a percent a quarter. Um, you know, the continuation of that selling today, I mean, that is a substantial move. I think at its lows today, down 11% from those recent all-time highs. Yeah. And so the, the issue is right. Uh, first of all, a very important company, right? I mean, in terms of market cap, okay, but you let's say Netflix and JP Morgan. I mean, one does movies at your house, right? This is this is this money center bank of money center banks. This is literally as the namesake, but implies Jamie Dimon has become the JP Morgan of, of his era. And the drop in gap in response to its quarterly results is a very negative circumstance. It's also uh, just a function of how steep and uncorrected the move was 48% yeah. uh, trading for those who are interested in the fundamentals. Uh, very near uh, sort of a 10 year high in terms of price to tangible book. And now here comes the counter trend. Whether you again want to call it a dip, a drawdown, a sell off, a decline, a correction, a drop, the question is, is it over? And it seems to my eye that this is not enough to properly correct the steep and uncorrected move of the preceding six months. Yeah. And again, you know, like if you felt like you missed this, this move that you called uncorrected right it had that consolidation a few months ago and then just kind of had that sort of runaway breakout and you know like the bullishness about you know that banks like this how they're going to do in a higher rate environment or how they're going to do a lower rate it, it, they seemed to all match up it seemed like there was you know it didn't matter what the rate environment was going to be like this bank was going to be just fine and listen this is a great bank i just think that if you miss the move you know if you get a move you know a, a correction back towards that consolidation you know from just a couple of months ago that would be a probably a great level to kind of get back in there this company no matter what's in store so you know 170 175 or something like that you see that rising moving average is probably going to be at those levels so to me that makes sense i'd love to see this get overdone to the downside in the short term and i'm sure you'd be in the camp that you wouldn't be pressing it there right you'd be looking for an opportunity to probably um get back in all right let's look at the s p 500 again you said it was down you know four percent from those recent highs one of the biggest moves to the downside that we've had um like i said in many months help us navigate where you think this thing uh, could go, where it could find support, and, and what your next move is in the SPX. Right. So in, in some of the statistics, and we've discussed some of this together, uh, all of us, is that um, anything goes up or down 30 base points in a day. Average stock move is about 35, 40 base points. Now a stock like JP Morgan can drop 6%, 7% in one day on news. But uh, what we found going back to the 1920s is that if you look at all instances where the S&P 500 drops 5%, meaning you go down two, it's noise. You go up three, it's noise. But once you're down 5% from an intermediate high, an all-time high, typically you go down more. And whether it's because people actually have stop losses that trigger at five and accelerates the selling and risk managers come in or people just start to get uncomfortable. There's no discomfort down two, down three, down five, and the money's starting to be lost. And so if you look at all instances, and there's several hundred of these going back to the 20s where you've dropped 5% plus, the moment at which five is triggered, which has not happened yet. Um, if you look at the median decline, it's about 8.5% of all those instances, and the average about 11.5%. And so one has to assume, while we haven't triggered five yet, that uh, we are headed somewhere in that direction. So let's uh, put some lines on this chart. We can flash that for fun, and what do we know is that we blew out through the upper band of that channel, and now we're back down into it. Let's put the midpoint in, and we can flash that too. And so the midpoint, uh, do we have to get down there? No, but if we leave it on, what we see here is that that would be an 8% peak uh, to midpoint decline, and that would be in line with historical precedent, and that would be altogether nothing. Yeah, nothing. Eight percent is nothing. Not after the kind of advance we've had over the past six months. Yeah, no doubt. Um, let, let's pull up a live chart really quickly of the SPX. And I mentioned this yesterday, Carter, on the market call. It was February twenty second. It was the day after Nvidia reported earnings. The stock gapped up. It was bringing the semis with it, and, and a lot of those names in the Gen AI. Let's let's make it a year to date um, chart really quickly here. I just want to show this kind of gap. And and again, we haven't seen too many gaps like this in the SPX. But you see that that day. 
you know, if you were to go to that Feb 21st close, right, where she had the cursor, where Amanda had the cursor there, that'd be about a five and a half percent move mm -hmm. back towards, you know, so that, that, you know, again, I know you're somebody who likes to focus on gaps. You had that great report out on worth charting people. Be sure um, to check that out there. Um, but, you know, to me, that would be kind of the first target. We've been trading it on Futures Day with the CME and just kind of rolling down um, at least or, or moving down our, our stop to the upside. And our initial target was kind of that 51.15 level, which is a 50 day moving average. And now we want to get toward uh, that 50,000 level. Here it is. This was the trade idea that we detailed uh, using options in the SBY. This would be last week. This was when the SBY was about five. 17 or so we were looking at the may 515 490 put spread it costs about 50 bucks at this point here um you know we are down um about uh you know, uh, you know, thirteen dollars or so. This trade is probably about a double. Um, and at this point, you know, our rules when we get a, a double here, we like to kind of take half off um, and kind of uh, and uh, you know take that profit, and let the other one ride. You could also look out maybe if you were looking to take that profit and look to next Friday, April twenty sixth expiration. You know, with the ETF around five hundred four, the five hundred two put would cost you about five dollars, especially if you're thinking about. Uh, you know, near-term hedges, a lot of geopolitical stuff, a lot of Fed speak, um, a lot of earnings are coming out. That's just how we would manage this trade right here. We got it going in our direction here. Let's take some of those profits off the table, let a bit of that ride. Um, so that's how we're thinking about it. And, and you can obviously check out, we'll continue to update um, the futures idea here. Um, I just want to kind of do a quick read here, people, because, you know, it's Tuesday. We're sponsored by Fidelity. We appreciate their sponsorship here. Trading options might be new for you or maybe you've been doing it for a while. Either way, Fidelity is your go-to source for clear and relevant information about trading options. For example, ask Fidelity professionals questions during their live small classes and coaching sessions and learn more with educational videos, articles, and webinars. Plus, with Fidelity's straightforward tools and technology, you'll find it easier than ever to trade options your way. See what's waiting for you at fidelity.com slash options. Carter, I know you've been trading options for a very long time. You do them a little differently than me, uh, but you and I did the options action program, you know, for 10 years together. I know you did it longer right until it ended just recently. And, you know, one of the things that we spent a lot of time on that program was talking about the different uses for options in and around earnings season, right? And so, you know, three main uses. One, most importantly, I think the easiest one, it's kind of the gateway drug for equity traders uh, to options is adding yield to an individual name. Mm -hmm. And you can sell calls. You talk about selling calls um, against long positions all the time. You talk about moving your feet. You get a move. Like, let's just say you've been running up this JP Morgan move into earnings. You didn't exactly want to sell it. You've been pretty happy about it. You know, one thing you could have done last week or whatever is sell calls against it. You create a little bit of a buffer, right, to the downside and you take in some premium. Um, that's one way to do it. Leverage, you know, is another one. If you just say, hey, maybe I don't want to be long anymore, but I still want some upside exposure. Maybe I was buying some calls doing stock replacement. That is really a risk management sort of strategy. And obviously risk management is a key part of this. And sometimes you can hedge a portfolio using options and, and the like here. So um, let's talk about earnings here. Um, and, and any of these names, you know, we had Goldman stock was up uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Morgan Stanley has been up very different price action. And JP Morgan that we just described bank America is down 3% today. So the money center banks are doing a little bit worse than the investment banks in this rate environment. Thoughts there, Carter, of what you've seen in this. Maybe they could pull up a Morgan Stanley. It's up one three percent today. We know that Goldman was up five percent. It's highs yesterday. I think closed up three percent or so. Um, thoughts on that? Um, the dif differential between these two groups within financials. Yeah, it's just that the investment banks and brokers, these two big ones, Goldman and Morgan Stanley, weren't performing in line with the move in City and J.P. Morgan and Bank America and so forth. So. They have been relative underperformers for the past three, four months. And their action here, I mean, this is what a pair of twos is. I mean, there's no thesis here to be short, chart-wise, to be long. Chart-wise, it's just, it's wandering across the screen. It has no character. And so one could either try to sell volatility, and that's one way to do it, or just do nothing. But my hunch is to stay away from this kind of thing. 
Yeah, you know, and I'll just say this, and, and you made you made a really good point. You said it's a pair of twos just looking at the chart. And let me tell you what I see, and, and you know, from a technical standpoint, let's back this out to a five year. I see a company that has a new CEO. I see a company that has a ver very diverse group of of, of um, products and services. You know what I mean? I see uh, they put up a, a good report. I think in what is like you know a seemingly difficult environment, especially from a rate standpoint. So the one year, let's toggle back to the one year. I see a little bit of a, a head and shoulders there. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, and, and you know, and, and again, that's just me. But thinking about it through the lens of, of some of the the sentiment, sentiment, and qualitative reasons. Okay, now you put put it to a five year again. You know, if things were to stabilize and this thing was able to kind of hold that moving average a little bit, this is one that I'd want to play for a breakout. Um, you know, like so that's the way I think about it, and that's the way I use technicals, just eyeballing them sometimes as one input. For you, I think a lot of our listeners, a lot of your subscribers, a lot of your institutional clients know that's what you lead with, right? So um, again, um, you know, like that's just a it's kind of a little bit of a compare and contrast of how you and I think about things. Um, I wanted to get your take quickly on Johnson and Johnson because in a market like this, with a huge name like this making new 52 week lows. What is that saying to you? Because I know you were bearish of UNH over the last few months. That's one that also a massive stock that made a new 52 week low recently, but since bounced off of it. Well, a lot of big, you look at Pfizer. I mean, right. Some of these great old line um, healthcare names are on the ropes. Uh, the question is, you know, Jane, and you'd have to, what, okay. This is where someone might say, well, yeah, but I want to know, do they have a drug cliff or they have no new products or, uh, they're going to say, what do they have? Baby powder lawsuits. Or, look, the thing's been under pressure. Look at the five-year chart. It's been rolling over uh, for quite some time. And the question ultimately is, at what point is this um, franchise, and we do have a five-year chart, look at that, or a 10-year chart even, let's go to that too. At what point is this franchise sort of um, uh, cheap, right? Or, or can one say, hey, a lot of the problems have been discounted. Now, the risk with that is that's what value traps are. If we stay on a 10 year and then try Pfizer, <laughs> we'll see something completely different, right? Something has been going down and down and down like that. So the question is, it's very hard to, it's why they call them value traps. One of the great idioms in markets along with don't fight the Fed or catch the falling knife or first loss vessels, but value traps are very real. So in the first instance, uh, maybe back to J&J, &J, I wouldn't step in and, and try to buy this weakness. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> selling a 140 put out, maybe uh, if you can get a weekly, a week or two, and covering your butt by having a 135, you know, that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that. That's interesting. And, you know, selling a put spread, that's something that's not naked. And you're basically taking advantage of a stock that mm -hmm. is kind of moved lower. The implied volatility, the price of options has probably moved higher. And you're just making, making a small bet about this thing actually going sideways to higher here. And that's one way to dip your toe in the water. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, we have United after the close tomorrow, or actually, I think it's pre opening. And again, I, I would be surprised if United Airlines was too different than what we heard from Delta um, last week. And you're going to be back with us on Thursday, um, and we're going to preview Netflix, which is going to be after the close, and then we'll take a deeper dive into American Express, and maybe we'll take a look at Procter & Gamble uh, and Schlumberger that are also um, on Friday uh, morning here, Carter. Um, I want to hit uh, a couple other names here. Um, you know, uh, let, let's let's pull up this, this one chart uh, of... Um, of uh, American Express here, because you, you're kind of charting with this. Um, I, I, I'm like, you know, I'm really focused on what LVMH is saying today. The stock is down a little bit. This is a stock that, again, this company um, has a lot of exposure internationally, has a lot of exposure with a lot of high-end luxury brands, some other brands um, that, that are also probably, you know, kind of mid-tier or so. We know that we've been detailing some of these kind of um, lower-end retailers here in the U.S. have been talking about the trade down a little bit. So to me, this is why American Express is so fascinating. And this chart, without any lines uh, or annotations, as you'd like to say, say, you know, this is at its high from its October lows was up 64%. It more than doubled the performance of the S&P 500. So massive breakout, long consolidation. It was a very like volatile consolidation period over the prior year and a half or so. So talk to me about what you're seeing here, and then I'll lay out some of the qualitative inputs that I'm focused on and, and construct a trade to kind of play for a break of this very steep uptrend. Right. So the same low as the S&P, of course, October 17 or thereabouts, same high, uh, two 
five, 10 sessions ago, in this case, a little earlier. But the important thing is how much outperformance. So if you see here on the next chart, uh, we're talking about something that doubles the performance of the S&P or more, right? S&P going up uh, 28. And so this is not software. It's not semiconductors. It's not AI. It's just what it is. It's a business that is dependent on spend. It's a business that, while it doesn't have the credit risk of a Capital One or a Discover where people just walk away from their thing, it is exposed to international, to business travel, and also uh, to the high end. So the question is, uh, where from here? Here comes the dip. How far might it go? Let's put some more lines on. We're now on trend. I think we break trend. Let's do another iteration. There's the arrow. That's a judgment, right? And then I think we're down into the level from which it uh, broke out. Now, that's a considerable drawdown from here. And while it maybe doesn't go all the way down there, fill the gap and so forth, one has to have that on one's radar as a possibility. And I would be at a minimum, if long, I'd be reducing or you know, selling calls or uh, even something more aggressive, selling calls and buying puts uh, to take uh, measures in this otherwise very steep, uncorrected, now just starting to correct stock. Yeah, and to be very clear, sell call by put. That is a risk reversal, and we detail that kind of trade idea against long stock um, as a collar uh, often, and that's a way to participate to the upside if you're long the stock and participate up to that short call strike, but then you use that call premium that you take in and you buy a downside put, which gives you um, you know, a basically floor on what you could lose on that long stock um, position. So maybe we'll detail a collar um, and a trade idea to name that is reporting next week and show you guys how we use uh, risk reversals or collars in that example. But this is one for the technical reasons that you just laid out, Carter. Um, I'm with you. This is how this this story kind of caught my eye. And then I think about just some of the stuff that we've heard about in, in, in kind of high-end retail um, and, and the like here. And that is basically American Express customer. You mentioned the point about credit risk, but if you start to see charge-offs going up at American Express, then you better watch out below as far as I'm concerned here. Um, so that's one of the focuses um, that I have. Um, so that's why that LVMH is kind of interesting to me. The implied move, um, uh, you know, 5% or 5.5% in either direction about $12. That seems kind of high. I just want to pull up this implied volatility chart. This is the price of options. And if you look at this, that blue line, which has been creeping up pretty dramatically, new 52 week high is saying that they're pretty high. Realize volatility that's in green. That's how much the stock has been moving over the last 30 days. So also moved up, but a very wide spread between implied and realized. That's basically saying that options prices are high to make a bet in this name using um, you know, long premium is expensive, which is one reason why I want to use a put spread to make a bearish spread. So I want to look out to June expiration today when AXP was trading about 217. I want to buy the June 220, 180 put spread. Uh, it cost me about $10. That's $3 in the money. So I'm buying one of the June 220 puts at about 11 bucks. I'm selling one of the June 180 puts at only about a dollar. We'll debate that people, uh, in right after I get done with the trade here. I have profits up to $30 between 210 and 180 on the downside. I have losses up to $10 between 210 and 220 with a max loss of $10 above 220. This trade idea risks about 4.5% of the stock price. It's already $3 in the money, as I said, so about 1%. So I break even down at 210, about 3.5%. Again, the implied move is about 5.5% in just one day in either direction. So the risk reward is about 3 to 1. I like that relationship. And as always, long premium directional trades. I'm going to cut my losses if the position is worth about 50% of the original premium um, that I spent. Okay. So as a rule, you generally don't want to sell options that are basically, you know, less than 1% of the stock price here. But here's the deal with this one, because I'm buying something that's already in the money a little bit here. Um, I want to look to offset a little of that high uh, options premium. So 180, the options market, if I look at the delta, is saying it's a low single digit probability of being the money. So I feel okay. If the stock were to go all the way down to 180 between now and June expiration, this trade is going to be very profitable. I will lose some money if it goes through that 180 strike um, on that short put, but I feel pretty much okay. The other way to do this is just buy the at the money or the in the money put in this case. And then if you start getting the stock going in your direction, breaking that that uptrend, then you would look to sell something to the downside or you could roll it down. Either way, you have a lot more optionality. I just like the kind of 
to kind of outline that three to one relationship. And I'm getting a little premium to take in. Um, what do you think of my levels here, Carter? If we would just pull up my chart really quickly here, not your chart. Um, you know, I look at that breakout level. Okay. I look at that 50 day moving average. That is that uptrend that you've so succinctly drawn here. Look at that rising 200 day. I know you look at the 150. It's right about at that 180 breakout level. I know that looks pretty concise here. It would take a pretty bad miss uh, and, and guide lower um, to get it there in the near term, but it could be an inline quarter and a negative guide that gets it over in the next month and a half or so down to 180. Yeah, I mean, you well, let's see, uh, let's say you get a, a drop in gap similar to that of JP Morgan, right? That would put you into the 205 kind of thing. Um, but to get to 180, you would have to have a more well, and that's the bet, right? A more serious give back in the general equity market. Right. Yeah, there, yeah. There's correlations here, of course, and this is a part of it. So to be 180, one can consider the S&P down 9, 10%. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, that would not be, um, you know, between now and June expiration, if we had a good old fashioned you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, rates keep going higher, commodities keep going higher, geopolitics keep, you know, seem to play a big role in this. You know, you and I will talk on Thursday. I think there's probably a JP Morgan sort of move out of some big cap tech stocks that people th also thought have been infallible. So to me, I think we're probably on the precipice of the sort of sell-off that we saw from the July highs last year to the October lows um, over the course of, let's say, the next few months or so. But we'll see. That's how I've been positioned. Um, Carter, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, you've been bullish of gold. Guys and Danny have been bullish of gold. Um, you took a look at silver for us and you were playing for a breakout and we got that breakout. We were doing it in the SLV, the ETF that tracks it. Give us a quick chart check um, on the SLV and we're going to update a trade idea that has worked out in the SLV. Uh, we think it's probably reached a level where I want to take the profit here, but I want to get a sense of where you think this thing is going. Yeah. Yeah. Um so when you have this kind of uh, sort of resolution, right, a breakout from a well-defined uh, level, uh, it's always very nuanced. How do you handle it? Meaning, do you take the profits? Uh, let's say it was 31 now. Oh, that's a screw up. Could have stayed yeah. for 31. Let's say you stay. Oh, we think it's going to 31. Now it's dropped to 26. That's a mess up. You, you were there. So very hard to know. We have that intraday reversal. Um, just apropos of... Uh, published work, what we did uh, for GLD, which is the exact same pattern, of course, is sell a strangle. Now, the, the thinking, and no one wants to do this, but the thing was at that point, everyone's talking about gold. People who don't even like gold like gold, so it's not likely to go higher. And then while one could say being naked GLD, gold after this kind of move, silver after this kind, not going to crash. And so after great volatility, you're looking at it, then volatility dries up. He's not going to go all the way back to 24. I, I mean, I can just uh, assert that with as much confidence as one can state. Anything's possible. And in turn, is it going to be 33 tomorrow? 30? No. So after a breakout, and that's what flags and pennants are about, you consolidate, consolidate. And this is exactly where no one does it, I guess, I'd sell a strangle. But anyway, uh, I'm all for yeah, harvesting a little bit, and that's what you're thinking, yes? Look yeah. This part, and let's look at the next one, and then I'll... Uh, yeah. Right over to you. So, you know, we 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 almost get to the former highs, we reverse. And so my, my thinking is just as articulated. Yeah, that and that's a great point that you made, you know, like the, the fact of the matter is that's what penance, that's what they that they do, you know, when they, when they flag like that. And so, you know, but trading options and picking strikes and picking expiration, and you know this really well, this is where trade management is really important, right? And so I just want to pull up the trade that we detailed um you know uh, about a week ago um well it was uh, april 2nd actually and so about two weeks ago and we're looking at june expiration and this was lining up with your charting and we were like playing for a breakout here we were at those prior highs it was 23.65 we bought the june 24 26 call spread it cost about 55 cents so again about you know a quarter of the width of that but we weren't getting too aggressive here but we were looking to play for a move to 27 uh or 20 we got to 27, pulled back, consolidating. If you just thought everything in line with Carter's take on the technicals and you thought it would consolidate in and around here, that short 26 strike call is going to basically, you know, continue to uh, decay. And, and that 24 that's in the money, it's just acting like stock, right? And so the idea is if this, if the SLV closed on June expiration at 26, it's going to be worth the $2 wide, $2. You paid 55 cents for it, $1.45 profit. But here's the deal right now at this price, okay, it's up 9%. That 
two dollar wide call spread that costs 50 55 cents it's worth about a dollar 10 so it's a double so again we're going to play by some simple rules i'm going to take half off or i'm just going to take the profit altogether. look to play for a pullback and then maybe you roll some strikes up or something like that so that's how i'm going to trade this thing i'm going to look to kind of book some winners not kind of wait and see what the next move is but the next move if i book the winner i'm going to be in a good position to kind of take a portion of those profits and move on carter does that make some sense to you as far as managing yeah trade? i mean it's it, it's being active and it's um it's reacting to a big price move and there's so yeah. many ways to do it and it's uh exactly we again we all have our styles but it, just to let's see again if if one says, but this is just the beginning, silver to go to its all-time highs, there's so much more catching up with gold, but that's a longer-term view. So it's knowing who you are in the market, what your time frames are. And for some people, this strength, this breakout is for the first time the reason to really get involved. Like finally, the sleeping giant is coming to life. And so they're buying new now, perfectly valid because they have a three-year view, uh, whether it's copper or whatever. Other people are like, I traded this thing well. I went in at 21. I, I sold out at 26. I don't want anything to do with it. And so it's all all, all of the above. Um, but what we do know, of course, if and as silver were to dip down to uh, the 23, 24 level from which it broke out, filling the gap, for instance, that would be an excellent time to recommit on the long side. Yeah. Um, you know, people say to us, and we get a lot of feedback, and we appreciate your food feedback, both good and bad. Um, that guy, Danny, myself uh, on, on the tape are, are too agreeable. We, we agree too much with each other. That means that we have similar market views. Um, you know, here's one where, um, you know, on, you come on Fast Money with us, you do market call with us twice a week. Um, you and I chat offline as, as Guy and Danny do. You know, we have not been on the same page as far as yields. Um, and, you know, we like to highlight the fact that, you know, when we get stuff right we, we we talk about it when we get stuff wrong we talk about it so we've been on the other side of this and again you know there's there's been 10-year yield let's just throw up the one-year chart has been amazingly volatile there's been plenty of times to be right and wrong uh, about this over the last um year or so um you've been a lower yield camp and you know till about two weeks ago carter look at that moving average when it was sitting there you know what i mean like it could have easily broken the other way with just a couple different comments than we've heard from the fed or a couple you know, little, little movements in some of this inflation data. Let's be clear on that. Right. But we've had this breakout of this range where we tested, I think 4.7. Um, the last time the 10 year was at 4.7 was in November. The S and P was much, much lower here. Thoughts on where this could go right now. Cause I want to update a trade on the XLU. I was trying to be a bit, um, contrarian thinking that maybe if we did have a move lower, um, in, in yields, we'd see the XLU breakout that hasn't happened here. So I'm just curious how you're thinking about the 10 year yield right now. Sure. Carl. Yeah. So I'm in the lower yields camp and at some point, if and as that needs to be abandoned, of course you move on. There are two ways to look at this and we'll, we'll do it this way. Yields are up 100 basis points in just a matter of months, 375 to 475. But yields for the past 18 months are up 30 basis points. So let's put a two-year chart up. And this is the question, right? Two years, we're looking at one year. Let's do a two-year time frame for this yield chart of 10-year treasuries. And this is the issue. Let's put a, a nice horizontal line along the top. That's the peak of October. Um, and what you see, of course, is... Not that top October off the left, the prior year. Oh, we know yeah, genius. Yeah. And so the question is, right, are our yields up there for 100 base points, but they're up 30 base points in 18 months. And so the truth is, it's both the higher for longer camp. 10 year treasury yields are up 30 base points in 18 months. That is not higher. <laughs> now, yeah. they're up 100 base points in, in a matter of months. That is higher. It would only be. Uh, valid the higher for longer camp if we get above five. And for now, what you've seen at the October highs, when we touched five, the, the mantra higher for longer became popular in the culture. And then it was abandoned in January. The Fed will cut 45 times. Recession is coming. And now it's being embraced again. Listen, recency is a tough thing. It's, it's, it, people fall into it. Whatever they see, they extrapolate more of. Higher for longer, we yeah, shall start. You know, listen, and I, I I was in agreement. Let's pull that chart off. It's kind of bugging me up there. Um, I was in agreement 
with you uh, on that. I liked your rationale about it. I, I think it's very different this time around, though, because, you know, even when we were going on our way to 5%, you know, in the fall, um, commodity prices were still low. The dollar was lower. Um, you know, I think what was going on in some other currencies around the world, geopolitics was a different environment. And, you know, some of the stuff that we're hearing, um, you know, like it just feels like we're, we're that much closer. Our friend Doug Cass uh, over at Seabreeze, um, partners and rights for real money has been talking about stagflation. We've been talking about stagflation for, for a while. The longer this goes on, the more embedded some of these higher prices are. And I think the Fed's in a tougher spot. So I think this retest of 5% is going to be quite fascinating. I'd be shocked if it was able to kind of pull back the way it was. And think about this from November, you know, from those late October highs and yields, what happened? You know, the Fed started getting a lot more dovish just vocally, you know what I mean? In November, in December. And it was that mid-December meeting where they basically, you know, it was like all systems go as far as that's when we started pricing in from three to six rate cuts in 2024. They're all but gone. I mean, we, you know, we'd be lucky if we get one or two. And I think a couple hotter prints push those into 2025, Carter. So that's my only pushback. You know what I mean? Oh, no, about, I get it. But isn't that higher. ironic? That's the point. They were pricing in six. Who's they? Some of the biggest economists and market yeah. players in the world. And now they are saying no. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing. But it's the data. It has to it, get it, above five. It's important. It has to it, get above five to data. validate the higher for longer crowd. Yeah, but it's but but what I would just say, Carter, it's six months more of data that oh, sure. were actually flying in the face of what they were saying. So again, we'll see. But this looks like it's a straight shot to five percent on the next you know hot data that we get. We got employment data that keeps defying all logic and the like. Here, um, I want to quickly update this XLU, and 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 you know this is a good example of listen. You know when you're trading, whether it be futures or equities or ETFs or options or whatever, like the whole idea of taking small losses is not a horrible thing. I know sometimes it's hard to admit you're wrong and, and book losses. One of the things that we talk about when we're trading options is like the last thing, especially long premium, and Carter likes to do sell premium, so this is not a problem usually for him. Um, but when you're long premium, you know, the idea of letting a loser just continue to decay and like let that options premium that you paid go to zero is just a dead bang loser for your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to do that at all. And so one of the reasons why we like to update these trades. So this was back on April 2nd. Um, you know, the XLU uh, was a bit higher. Um, we were looking to buy the June 6570 call spread. It cost about a dollar fifty. I think it was trading around 6375. We're about a dollar lower here. So now we're down about two percent at 6270. The call spread that cost a dollar fifty is now worth about a dollar. I want to take this loss. I want to kind of move on. If I'm just looking at the technicals of the XLU, it's kind of broken that uptrend that's been in place over the last couple of months. We just had that little, little discussion about yields. If the 10-year yield is going 5%, I think the XLU is going lower. Uh, I'm not looking to make a big bet or prognostication about this one way or another, but I have a losing trade and it's kind of flying in the face of some of my views on the broader market here. So I want to take this 50 cent loss and I want to move on. Thoughts here, Carter, on the XLU, just looking at this trade. It's been in yeah, a down the trend. Is the decay, right? I mean, this is where one has to be tactical and fairly um, uh, abrupt in terms of pivoting uh, because it's an options trade, right? Now, uh, in terms of what has happened, nothing's happened. Right, you're talking yeah. about an ETF that represents the entire S&P 500 utility sector, slow, dull companies, and it's down a dollar on a $64 base. So nothing has happened. The chart hasn't really changed. Um, the minor uptrend line since February, but what's coming into play is the intermediate uptrend line since October. Um, anyway, I, I would say yes. I think that's the right move based on the. Uh, approach, which is an options trade, in terms of XLU being about to collapse or anything like that, I would just say this is a, a, a pair of twos, but my bias is to the upside. All right, um, Carter, we appreciate you doing the heavy lifting with Guy Away. It was a fun uh, kind of ping pong conversation back and forth. Uh, you're going to be back with us on Thursday. I think our good friend Danny Moses is going to be joining us. I think you're going to be on set, hopefully, so we'll have some fun uh, in studio. Tomorrow, I will have Liz Young. That will be EY from SoFi with me in studio. We're going to take your questions. We're going to go a bit longer. I know Carter's got to get out of here, so we really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you to our fine sponsor, Fidel. Fidelity, we appreciate these days just going through a bunch of trade ideas and a bunch of names and going through the charts. So thanks a lot, Carter, for being with us. We'll see you on Thursday. See you tonight, I think. Oh.
Oh, see you on Fast Money tonight. All right, everyone. Check us out. 5 p.m. at the NASDAQ Fast Money. Uh, Carter and I will be there with Karen and Tim. Thanks, everyone.